Yeah, welcome to our AI adventure. Um, we had to learn a lot to get to this point, and we still have a lot to learn. We just wanted to share some of the things that we can. Yeah, it's kind of a, a bit unusual because we're going to have two presenters this time. <laughs> so I actually wonder if this is right because it looks like a. We're actually data scientists. We just play one. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> but do you see how this screen is just a little square? I wonder if we actually done something wrong. Or just yeah, it's my birthday, so I sacrificed my day for you guys. Thank you. It doesn't seem that playing is actually leading to full screen. Do you know how to make it full screen? <laughs> we have PhDs, but we don't understand about computers. 640 by 480 ought to be good enough for anyone. Um, Detect the slaves. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Some of the things that the monitor is. Keynote live? Yeah. Try, try Keynote live. Yeah, try, press that button. Wait, Keynote live? Yeah, yeah. Let's see what happens. The other, that's for other viewers that are connected to it over the internet. It's kind of funny because this is the third time we're going to present this. We didn't have this problem before. Yeah, it's a resolution issue let's, for let's sure. Try this. Yeah. Okay, that'd be better, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit about uh, our experience. Um, I'm PhD in computer science from UFC. Ted is uh, in mathemat mathematics. Yeah, and Corinne is in graphic design. Well, I don't know if we need to say this here. I think everybody believes it, but if machine learning is applicable to your domain and you're not investing it, you will be overtaken. It's not hype. Uh, it's, a, it's not a buzzword, it's, it's real. It's changing how we approach a lot of problems in computer science. So what problem did we have? Well, our customer came to us, SHI, and they sell a lot of hardware. But when they sell a lot of hardware, you get a lot of questions. But a lot of those questions are the same. So their support people are burdened by all these common questions, and they don't have time to answer the interesting questions. So that generated essentially four kind of uh, very difficult AI problems to solve. One is that we need to be able to generate queries into various data sources from these questions. And there could be a wide variety of data sources. One of the data sources is even human beings, but there could be price database or documents or all of these things. So that solving that problem would be um, a great AI problem to solve, but we just have to solve it partially. Now, once you find some query results, you have to generate text from those. That's to be kind of natural text. Well, that's kind of a core AI problem to solve. How do you generate text in a natural way? How do you classify these questions so that you're actually relating the interesting questions to people so you can answer them? And then how do you reward the humans and the machines in the system so that they start to perform more effectively? Right? So how, how can you learn as the system is used? And how are people rewarded so that they continue to enjoy interacting with the machine that's helping them? How do we augment people in this system? Well, we're not the only ones looking at this kind of thing. And um, just like we saw with the Campbell leaderboard, there's these leaderboards for SQUAD, NLC, and the smartphone. These are machine comprehension leaderboards. There's an arms race going on right now for who can build the best system to answer questions. Now, SQUAD is interesting because it's a test that's designed to be easy for machines to solve. So what do you do? You take a bunch of Wikipedia pages, and then you pay people $9 an hour at Mechanical Turk, and they go out there and they answer questions about those Wikipedia pages. Well, they don't have to type in their answer. All they have to do is select the answer in the Wikipedia page, and that gives you a span. So now you can see that this is a very tractable problem for machine learning, because you don't have to generate text at the other end. All you have to do is find the coordinates of where the answer is in the text. And there's a lot of activity here, a whole bunch of wide variety of techniques, some of them proprietary, some of them open source. Every day you can check this and there'll be someone with increased accuracy kind of whittling away at the decimal points, exceeding human performance. Now, exceeding human performance at $9 an hour. <laughs> okay, so now another test that it's given, this is from the Hannah Smart from Microsoft. This is interesting because it's very similar. They take Bing search results, you ask a question, 
you don't always get the answer you're looking for when you get a search result in Google. You have to go through it and find the actual answer within that. But wouldn't it be nice to have an English language answer that answers exactly the question you asked? Well, now they're not asking for a span within the document, they're asking for the output being English text. So this just takes the machine comprehension, reading comprehension to the next step, which is to generate natural language text. And that. Back to me problem, now, yeah. Do. So we're gonna give a little survey of how are those things presented before on Squad and MS Mark were actually done, right? So any single slide that we're gonna present from now on it could probably take a whole hour of presentation. Um, so we don't intend this to be a lecture, okay? Um, so since we're talking about machine comprehension, let's uh, first think about what is actually reading as a human being, right? When you go to school, you first learn the alphabet, then you learn how to put the alphabet together into words, and then into sentences, and then eventually into paragraphs and books, right? So you understand that you learn step by step, right? So you get this meaning of the words and then meanings of the sentence gradually as you are trained in your education, right? So you can imagine that um, a computer will only go through the same process, right? Um, so our question would be, how do we actually train a computer to read, right? So one of the ways to do this is to imagine that reading is kind of like a function, a mathematical function, where you get a corpus of data, right? A book or a paragraph or you know, someone talking to you, and then you get understanding out of it. So understanding is the output, right? And if you define a little bit further into a question and answer model, it's also a function. But in this case, you have two inputs. You have the corpus of data that has the answer, and you have the question, right? So corpus of data, question, a two input function, you get the output, the answer, right? So that's the way that the uh, squad is doing. So you get, you get the corpus of data and you get a span that marks, highlights where the answer is, right? MS mark is a little bit more complicated because it actually generates a sentence, generates a paragraph that actually an answers it. So it's more advanced. Um, how do you actually make that into a machine comprehension, make, make a computer actually understand that, right? Um, so the first thing, and this is kind of a philosophical question, can a computer actually inter interpret text like a human being, right? So that's something that you have to think a little bit about. Ted and I, we argue about this kind of stuff all the time, um, right? So imagine a service like Google, right? And I'm being a little bit uh, obtuse in here on purpose, and I'm, I'm imagining that Google is an information retrieval system that only retrieves based on matching keywords, right? It's not entirely like that, but just imagine that it is, right? So a machine comprehension system actually w works on top of that, right? Google go there, goes there, finds the paragraph that seems to answer your question, the machine comprehension system actually figures out if it, the answer is there or not, okay? So it's built on top of information retrieval. So one of the questions that you may ask later on is, okay, if I give a paragraph that has nothing to do with the question, what is gonna happen, right? If you force a person to answer a question based on a, on a text that she doesn't understand, she's probably gonna say something wrong, right? But that's for later. Um, so how can computers actually read, right? First, the computer has to understand words, right? On a computer, words kind of do not mean anything. So you have to transform that into numbers, right? So a naive way, that, uh, some people would probably think, and it was actually re referred before, would be to use one-hot encoding, right? So for categorical uh, variables, that works fine because you have a limited amount of variables. But for words, imagine that you have a vocabulary of a million words. One-hot encoding would not work, right? So one-hot encoding, for those that do not know, is a, would be a huge vector of the number of elements that you have. So if you have a million vocabulary, you'd have a, a million positions, and everything would be zero and you would have only one in the position of that specific word. So let's say banana is position 10,000, you'd have 999,999,000 zeros and one, one in the position 10,000, right? So it's pretty non-functional for this scenario, right? So 
a better case in here is actually to have a model of the language, right? Um, so that brings us to embedding. And embedding is not a relatively new thing. It was created by Benju about 2003. Um, but it didn't actually catch up because computers were really slow back then, right? Um, so about 2013, this guy called Mikolov created this very impactful work called word to vec And that's when things actually started to develop in NLP. Um, more recently, in 2014, we actually had a Glove by Pennington. And that's when things actually started to happen for real. Um, so Glove was one of the first, um, Glove and word to vec were actually one of the first um, applications of unsupervised learning. Um, so let's talk a little bit about word to vec So how many people here have actually heard about word to vec Okay, so excuse me if I go to it too fast for those that do not know, and excuse me if I'm a little bit obtuse for those that actually know about it, right? So word to vec basically is a way to translate words into what they call an embedding vector, okay? Um, I mean, word embedding is like that. Word to vec Basically, what it actually is doing is predicting words. Or, so for example, in this case here, you have a specific strategy. So there are two stra strategies, so the continuous bag of words. So in this case, what happens is that you have a context, and you want to predict a word in that context, right? So if you say, for example, I want to say, I am very hungry, and the four words are, I am very hungry, and you want to predict that very is there. So you, you train with I, am, you don't put the very, you put the hungry, and you expect to get very back. Right? Um, so you see this kind of technology, for example, in your keyboards, when you're typing a message to your girlfriend or to your husband. Right? So a second strategy is skipgram. Skipgram is kind of the opposite. So you have a word, and you want to predict what kind of context that word is going to appear in. Okay, so the embedding on word to vec was kind of like a consequence. It was not really um, a planned thing. And that's when Glove actually came in. So what Glove did was actually create a model, a real model of the language, right? So it basically it encoded the real relationship between the words and its meanings. And the way that is, that is done is by um, creating this co-occurrence matrix, okay? So I'm not gonna explain with too many details what the co-occurrence matrix does, but basically you see the A, B, C, D there. So imagine that that is, those are words, okay? So it's not, they are not letters, they are words. And the highlighting there is basically a windowing that is gonna be, is gonna run over that text. Right? So it's gonna, it's gonna do something like this. C appears after D how many times? And it's gonna put in that table, okay? So it, for example, D appears after E. So you go there, E and D, and you put the one there. And then you count how many times that, that happens. So you do some dimensionality reduction, you come up with actual vectors. Right, these vectors can have 300 dimensions, 600 dimensions, and you have a model of your language. So both techniques have limitations, okay? So they kind of lack the ability of truly represent the meaning of, an, of a sentence. They, they don't understand the context that they are in. They're kind of like an average of all the meanings that the, the model has seen for that word. So imagine like a word like get or play, you know, they have like hundreds of meanings, right? Um, so it creates a certain degree of complication, right? Um, so that's when you actually get to Elmo, which is something that Ted is gonna talk about. Yeah, so where did Elmo come from? It comes from the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And these guys are doing a lot of good things. They're building fundamental libraries that we can use to build natural language processes all that are open source, and with the idea that it's very reusable. For instance, Elmo is a drop-in replacement for Glove, Golf, and drop-in as best as, as that can be. 
So what did you see the flag? The effectively we got a vector for each word. But that means that a word like run is going to get the same vector wherever run is used. Although run has many meanings. It's a run for to use in the dictionary. So that's that's not very accurate. That's not capturing the essence of what that word means. So instead of Elmo what you do, you don't just give it a word and it comes back with a vector, you give it a sentence and it comes back with a set of vectors. Not just a set of vectors, it comes back with three 1,024 dimensional vectors for each word. Now that does mean that there's a lot of data to process, but well, we're getting used to that, right? So what we have in the illustration here is a sentence, and then you can see three of those vectors are just projected into two dimensions for convenience when you're doing stuff looking at a page. The black vector you can see is not really dependent on the word position. Like if, let's say we use the word field at the end, you can see there's a tiny little black vector that's the same. Well, if it's elbow, that one vector on that one layer is independent of word position. It acts a lot like love. The other two vectors, the red and the blue, are from different layers in the LSTM, the big thing. And those supposedly, then we need to investigate this more, right? People have created this set of vectors, but we don't know what all of its properties are yet. We believe that these model the part of speech and word sense. So they capture more subtle details of the words in this vector format. But one of the most interesting things about this are the semantic qualities that emerge from these vectors. So what we see is that parallel relationships where the vectors model transformations. So let's say from man to woman or king to queen, that vector parallel relationship gives you those transformations between those parts of speech. Well, how does, how does that work with the incidence matrix? It would be hard to explain with Elmo because it, it, it is created from the neural network. But with love, the objective function is that we take the, we want vectors that have a dot product equal to the logarithm of the value of that incidence matrix. So when you subtract vectors in this way, you get subtraction in the logarithm which gives you a ratio of those things in the incidence matrix. Well, you can see that the, the ratio of occurrence of these things where the, the relative occurrence of man and woman, king and queen, that ratio is something that would have semantic qualities. And so that's where that emerges. Other research shows that maybe what love is doing is an implicit singular value decomposition of that instance matrix. Like there's other ways to get these, other than the ways that they are generated. Right, so... Now the computer knows how to read, but can it understand what it's reading? So if you go back to the first slides where we're talking about the squad data set, um, you're gonna see that there is a bunch of architectures that uh, implement uh, solutions for machine comprehension, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about two parts of those architectures, right? So those architectures are usually based on what they call sequence to sequence models, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about two relatively new uh, developments on, on that area um, with very little detail, to be honest, so don't be scared. So one of the um, things that came out about um, two years, perhaps three, um, three years ago, was attention models. So attention models, they're basically this big matrix here, right? So on the uh, vertical axis, you have the, the context, right? And the, in this case here, in the horizontal axis, you have the question, right? So now imagine we are looking at those words and we are seeing them as human beings, but imagine that those are actually vectors, right? Um, so you can see that it, this is a, a color map of this relationship, right? You can see, for example, airspeed and airspeed, they highly correlate, right? And it, I left my mouse over here so you guys could actually see the value. So you get a very high correlation there. And what is the answer here? It's here, right? So with what attention does is basically it reads the um, paragraph and it keeps that in, in mind. And then when the question comes, it go, it's gonna find out where the answer probably is, right? So what happens afterwards? So you have to extract this block of information, right? And by, to extract that block of information, you can use, for example, something that also came about two or three years ago called pointer networks also um, related to sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. 
Right? And I'm going to give a little example here. Of course, again, no, no details. But basically, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model um, is, a, is an architecture that uses recurrent networks. Right? So you have a sentence. And for example, in this case, Apple is not IBM. And let's say you want to separate, you want to find out the positions of the nouns, Apple and IBM. Right? So sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, for example, are widely used in translation, right? You get, you enter an, an input of a sentence in one language and you get an output that is a sentence in another language. So these guys, they, they change the sequence to sequence model to instead of getting um, a translation to another language, to get a translation into positions, right? So I'm giving an example here. Apple is not IBM. The network for this particular case only will, but we want to find out only nouns would return one because Apple is the first word, will return four because IBM is the fourth word. Um, so this kind of thing is also applied to like calculation of like convex holes. You can train uh, a model like this to do all kinds of operations that has um, multiple outputs based on a variety of input. Um, so if you want to look more about these things, you can go to the squad uh, data set um, leaderboard and you're gonna find out um, architectures that use, employ these techniques, like BIDEF uh, from the Allen Institute, um, RNET, SNET from Microsoft, and uh, the leader now is QANet from Google. Um, so after that, it's back to Ted. So do we really have enough here to teach computers how to read? That's the question. And you can, you can go ahead and try out the BIDEF demo. Just, just Google for it. And you can enter in any paragraph of text and any question, and it will do its best to find and highlight that answer within that paragraph. But there's no reasoning. All it's using is linguistic patterns to find you know, a, a range of text that matches the way you ask, ask that question. In order to actually do IT support, it's very tricky. You have to go up to these start turning it on and off again. Um, and there's other answers, too. We probably need reasoning. Well, how are we going to get there? You've seen this slide before. The singularity is coming. By the year 2030, machines will have the equivalent computing power to the human brain, and we'll be able to do IT support as effectively as we can. Exponential growth. For some reason, hardware is growing at an exponential rate. I'm very excited. But wait a minute. Why has my computer gotten any better since 2010? That seems to be warming up the singularity. And the reason is, is we hit the wall on clock speed. So single threaded performance has it's been improving, right? But it has not been improving at the same exponential rate that we were looking for. But we have been increasing the number of cores. So maybe the singularity is still coming. It might be. What has a lot of cores? effectively, is a GPU. So are we going to build superhuman AI performance using GPUs? Well, uh, according to Wikipedia, if you look at this image, it almost looks like it. But I don't know. Let's zoom in up on that corner up there. So what are we actually measuring here? I never told you what this graph is. It's like gigaflop per dollar a year. If a superhuman AI costs billions of dollars, is it really as cost effective as manufacturing more human beings? Probably not. So that wouldn't be successful. So and now we have to look at this graph. Okay, just looking at this graph, I don't know. I, I see perhaps anomalous behavior at times, I think it was too short. So if we go and look on tech power up, then you can actually get gigaflops, list price, figures for GPUs. And what I'm seeing here is linear performance. NVIDIA would deny that, they would say uh, it's much faster than that, but you know what this looks like? This looks like increasing arable land and farming practices. Well, how are we doing that? Well, we're increasing the arable land by reducing the nanometer scale. Again, we can only go so far with that. So eventually, GPUs are going to get bigger and bigger, I guess, if we're supposed to have this hardware singularity. Now, the other problem is Bitcoin. Why is Bitcoin a problem? Well, Bitcoin is driving up the price of GPUs, which is reducing our gigaflops per dollar performance, which means that 
singularity exponential growth is not occurring. Constant battle between AI research, inspiring data to produce, and Bitcoin miners trying to get there. Well, all right. So we might be skeptical about hardware singularity, but really, the substrate doesn't matter. We're all software, and if you look at um, what's going on in software, it is just tremendous. The, the development and rapid progress we're seeing in AI and machine learning right now. And why is that? Well, software can truly give us an exponential growth of feedback again. Well, if you take other libraries and use them in your code, there's a network there, an interaction between all of these different software modules that is capable of producing exponential growth, like reading between software. Hardware, I believe that the hardware, the pinch of hardware exponential growth is market driven. It's that, I don't want to buy this unless it's twice as good. Well, you can't keep doing that forever because you get a roll of the clock speed. So how do you know? How do you know you've reached the software singularity? Well, you're working in TensorFlow, and by the time you've ported your code to the new version of TensorFlow, a new version of TensorFlow is out. So yes, we have reached the singularity. We've entered this realm of transformation where the future is inconceivable, in other words, API incompatibility from our point of view. How much time should we keep going? Yeah. Ted likes to talk about uh, AI safety. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. we'll, just, we'll talk about it very briefly. In fact, it's irresponsible not to talk about it because we've seen a number of cases where society can be harmed by say, manipulation. Now, don't worry about killer robots yet in killer cars, but killer robots are likely what we'll see is manipulation of human beings by intelligent machines. And if you um, have seen the Google I.O. presentation today, you may be getting a call from a Google Assistant representative mm, right. pretending yeah, to be a human being. To a machine or a human. You can learn all about this on Future of Life. This is a, an organization that is a, a strong advocate for AI safety, all the different dangers. But I think what's, what's interesting is that now the most difficult philosophical problem in the history of humanity has a deadline. Why? computers conscious or not. Well, if they're conscious, can you give them dangerous or even boring work? Is that ethical? We really need to solve this. <laughs> um, and we probably need to treat machines at least as well as we treat our employees in some cases. Security? I can just talk about Tensor versus PyTorch. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people ask, well, how do I get started on this kind of thing? And it depends. Are you applying for a job at Google or at Facebook? If you want to apply at Google, go to TensorFlow. Facebook is PyTorch. No, not really. Uh, but, well, it is a factor, right? Um, TensorFlow is amazing hardware, eight times speed up on what they were showing last year. So if your goal is deployment production, TensorFlow is actually a very good choice. If you enjoy working with Python, you prefer it, if you want to do some rapid development and you like the PyTorch API, then that's the direction you should go. So rapid development, um, PyTorch production, TensorFlow is a good choice. Well, what we'd like is we'd like people to share their ideas about where they want AI to go. This is a human problem, whether um, we're inundated with killer robots or not. We have to make good decisions and be good to each other. Enjoy the meetup. You're, you're here. Okay. And that's it.